The first speaker today is, or for this afternoon is Dr. Isabel Miles. So Isabel completed her emergency medicine training in Ottawa and completed the BCCSU Addiction Medicine Fellowship in Vancouver. She currently works as an emergency physician and addictions physician at St. Paul's Hospital. Here to talk about shakes and sweats, management of alcohol withdrawal in the ED. Please welcome Elizabeth Miles. Thanks, Rob. So um, again, in this session, we'll talk about management of alcohol use disorder, but with a focus of management of withdrawal in the ED. So here are the learning objectives and keeping those in mind, the outline for today's talk will start with screening for alcohol use disorder. So trying to identify early in the progression of the disease of alcohol use disorder, intervening early. And then if someone presents with alcohol withdrawal in your ED, how do you risk stratify them to decide, do they need outpatient or do they need inpatient management with perhaps a focus on special scenarios such as rural settings and benzodiazepine resistant. And finally, for your patients who are ready in terms of stages of change to either reduce or abstain from alcohol use, what are some tools with regards to relapse prevention that you can provide your patient? I have nothing to disclaim, but I do I have nothing to disclose, but I do have a disclaimer. So alcohol use disorder and even just alcohol withdrawal can be a talk in itself for about an hour or more. So this is really just a focus on giving you guys a few clinical pearls to really take back to your practice to enhance the care of these patients. So first, screening for alcohol use disorder. So there are lots of screening tools available, and probably the most commonly known one is the CAGE questionnaire in the adult population. What I wanted to focus on is the single question screen, because it's essentially a question that we use often in our social history during the emergency department. So simply asking a patient how much they eat or how much they drink in a single setting. And then with that, again, if that patient has a positive screen, it does not necessarily mean that they have alcohol use disorder, but perhaps at risk. So to confirm that diagnosis, it's important to then go through the DSM-5 criteria to ensure that they meet criteria for alcohol use disorder. The main point of this is that all these screening tools have similar sensitivity and specificity. It's important to just pick a tool where the components are easy for you to remember and easy for you to put into your clinical practice. So then if you identify a patient that's at high risk and then presents with withdrawal, how do you manage that within the department? The most important initial step is actually going through identifying patients who are at high risk, either at high risk of complicated withdrawal, so needing high amounts of benzodiazepine to manage their symptoms, or at risk of developing seizures or delirium tremens, or at high risk for actually sustaining adverse events related to the physiological changes of withdrawal, or adverse effects of the medications that we use for management of alcohol withdrawal. If they're determined to be high risk, essentially these patients need to be managed in a monitored setting. That can be observation in the emergency department, inpatient admission, or a medical detox. If they're found to be low risk, then you can manage them in a community setting. This is not a dichotomous thing. Patients live in a spectrum, and that can be changed either by different safety factors, clinical settings in terms of restrictions of what you have available to you, or even their progression throughout the disease. So how does web risk stratify? Essentially, there's two types of features. They fit two, two types of categories. The first being actual components or the criteria features of the withdrawal itself and other patient factors that might shift your safety in terms of management. There's actually very little evidence in terms of guiding us with regards to this. So this is a compilation of that evidence that is out there, my own clinical practice, and what I've seen with regards to practice with my addiction colleagues. So first with withdrawal features, what is actually the pattern of consumption for your patient? Not only how long have they been consuming alcohol, but how they consume throughout the day. So for example, someone who drinks eight beers throughout the day, but actually needs one beer in the middle of the night to stave off withdrawal, has a much higher risk of developing complicated withdrawal than someone who clusters those eight beers in the evening, but can go throughout the day without any symptoms of withdrawal whatsoever. Ask them about their history of withdrawal. So what was their prior experiences? When was the last time they were able to go a couple days without drinking? What were their symptoms? Was it mostly subjective such as anxiety or were there mostly objective symptoms such as diaphoresis and tremor? Did they require medications? Were they able to manage at home alone? Do they have any history of seizures or delirium tremens? Not only that, but when did it occur? Did it occur on the day of presentation or was it 10 years ago when that pattern consumption of alcohol was much different? 
And objectively, how do they look in your emergency department? Do they mostly have, again, those subjective symptoms of anxiety? Or do they visibly look like they're in withdrawal exhibiting diaphoresis and tremor? What I would caution you is that many of our patients with alcohol use disorder just have a baseline tremor. So look at the tongue for tongue fasciculation for a more objective kind of confirmation of that tremor. The other component is the other factors surrounding your patients. What are their comorbidities? Are they elderly? Do they have hepatic dysfunction where they would be at higher risk of developing things like delirium or falls, either from the experience of the withdrawal or the medications that we provide them? Will it be difficult for them to really see what their withdrawal symptoms are like if there's other things that they consume? For example, are they going to go through concurrent opioid withdrawal where their symptoms of opioid withdrawal will overlap those of the alcohol withdrawal? And lastly, what is the setting on how they're going to manage at home? Are they home alone? Is there a lot of stairs and they're elderly at high risk for falls? Are they reliable to be able to recognize and return if their symptoms worsen? So considering all these factors, Maldonado and all actually in 2015 reviewed the literature, took some of these components and then developed a clinical decision rule to help guide you with regards to risk stratification. But before that, I do want to highlight my first pair, Pearl. So be aware of diagnostic momentum. Always confirm history of seizure and delirium tremens with your patient. What I mean by that is even though it might be documented on previous consults or emergency department visits, always explore a little bit what they mean by that. More commonly than not, patients describe seizures as actually being symptoms of withdrawal without any loss of consciousness or actually episodes of syncope while they're intoxicated. For delirium tremens, patients often use that as a way to describe their tremors and is not actually experiencing delirium tremens. Why this is important is that this will shift very much your risk stratification for your patients. And overwhelmingly, I find that patients have those misnomers rather than true seizures or DTs. So what is the pause? So like I said, Maldonado and all looked at the literature and looked at all those risk factors that might be correlated with higher risk of complicated withdrawal. They then developed on the right hand side this tool and then applied it to all patients who were admitted to an inpatient ward. They excluded those essentially that were already exhibiting features of alcohol withdrawal or severe alcohol withdrawal or weren't able to reliably complete the pause. Severe withdrawal was determined to be a composite score including CUA greater than 14, physician discretion of needing barbiturate or benzodiazepines, seizure or DTs. They found with a cutoff score of four or greater, they had a sensitivity and specificity of greater than 90% to predict severe withdrawal or impart higher risk of severe withdrawal as determined by what they've outlined here. Keep in mind that this was not validated in the ED and there was actually a very, very low event rate for things that we consider as truly being complicated withdrawal, so seizures or DTs. So you've determined your patient to be at high risk of, uh, determine your patient in terms of their risk stratification for withdrawal. So if they're low risk, you can consider managing them as an outpatient. And this is where there might be a bit of a pivot in terms of how we manage our patient. I would actually implore you guys to consider gabapentin rather than benzodiazepines. Although there's low evidence so far, and it is off label, What's been shown is it's much better for management of cravings for alcohol withdrawal, and it actually relates to much less sedation. Um, sorry about that. In terms of overall withdrawal symptom management, it's actually better than benzodiazepines, in particular at days four or beyond. It can then parlay eventually to relapse prevention, so helping reduce the drinking or maintaining abstinence after the period of withdrawal. And in my clinical experience and what little data is available, there's actually reduced risk of dependence, diversion, and overdose risk in utilizing this therapy instead of benzodiazepines. Regardless, you don't want your patients to kind of just coast after this. You want to reassess them within 48 hours to ensure that they're not developing those severe features of withdrawal that would necessitate an inpatient admission or at least observation. So what does that actually look like in practice? So there's no standard dosing. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, some of my colleagues use regular dosing, so my addiction colleagues. I actually prefer using PRN dosing, so letting the patient kind of guide their management. Generally, I prescribe 300 milligram tabs. I tell the patient to take one to three tabs every four to six hours for tremors or diaphoresis. Note that I do not include anxiety. I find that this lends to overuse and actually a bit of chemical coping. 
the max that you would use is around 3,600. This is only in the context of acute withdrawal. So again, those first couple of days, you don't want them to maintain this dose long term. And at most, I dispense 24 tabs because this is a fail safe. It tells me that if the patient needs more, they should be reassessed, either that they're developing that severe withdrawal that would need them to be monitored for um, symptom management, that there might be evidence of overuse for those anxiety symptoms, or they're kind of in the middle range and they might just need a bit of an adjunct to help with any subjective symptoms. Always warn your patients that they should not be driving with this sedative and that there always is a risk of sedation, although it is less than um, benzodiazepines. So the adjunct I was talking about is clonidine. It's essentially using that same strategy that ICU does with regards to Presidex as being a GABA sparing strategy. So acute care management. These are for your patients. You're unable to rule out high-risk withdrawal. That doesn't mean necessarily that they will develop high-risk withdrawal. It just means that they need a period of observation, a monitored setting to assess what trajectory they're going with. Symptom triggered overwhelmingly is better than regular benzos with regards to length of stay, but also adverse effects related to benzotoxicity. And most commonly, CWA is used. However, CWA has limitation. It relies on subjective scoring and hasn't been validated in the ED. So a lot of alternative scores have been looked or have popped up. So the BOS, the SHOT, and the Glasgow are essentially taking all those subjective scores out and focusing more on objective criteria. The RAS score has been utilized more in the ICU given its familiarity already within that setting. Know that there's still limitations with all those scores and there's still a risk of over sedation or over medication with any of these symptom triggered uh, scores. In particular, I would say the RAS in the ED setting given they're targeting a, an element of sedation. So the next step is you've started doing symptom triggered management. What benzodiazepine are you going to use? There's no evidence really guiding us. What I would implore you is that you guys use or that you use lorazepam in an ED setting, unless for sure you can say that your patient is healthy, they don't have any comorbidities, in particular hepatic dysfunction, and there's a clear disposition, meaning that they're going to be admitted because diazepams metabolize hepatically into active metabolites with unpredictable buildup that tends to peak at day two or three. There can be often a risk of benzotoxicity up to a week. And remember, if they continue to drink alcohol in that context, there is a compounded risk of sedation. Lastly, to round out your management, consider investigations oh, to help guide uh, your benzodiazepine choice. So in particular, LFTs, and this will be helpful when talking about relapse prevention medication. And be mindful of anchoring. These patients are at high risk of other acute medical illnesses so just consider a parallel differential diagnosis. So an next pearl is remember CEO as a tool to guide clinical assessment. Be aware of its limitations. So as you can see, CEO really depends on a patient that's oriented. A lot of subjective questions related to the patient that could be altered either by provider um, experience, comorbidities, in particular acute medical illnesses or psychiatric illnesses, um, as well as other co-occurring withdrawals. So I would consider or advise that you do your initial score yourself and then reassess in two to three hours to ensure that CO is actually properly monitoring your withdrawal on your patient. So what about rural settings where there's a limitation of availability of those sort of monitored setting? This is where I talked about the spectrum and then that shift in terms of what high risk might be. This is where it's even more important to really establish safety. What is their supports at home? Is there somebody who can either help them monitor their withdrawal but, or bring them to acute care if things were to worsen? With medications, I would say still trial that gabapentin, but if benzos are required, consider daily dispense at a maximum of 40 milligrams of diazepam daily equivalents. Task another individual to monitor withdrawal, but also dispense medication and ensure that the medications are locked up. You still wanna follow up your patients daily and use telehealth as a tool to do that. And consider where the closest acute care center, if they're three hours away, are they gonna be able to present themselves or be brought if they're presenting in delirium tremens. Regardless, some individuals will require that inpatient setting and you won't be able to establish safety at home. So last component of withdrawal management is benzo resistant withdrawal. There's no definition. In the literature, they haven't been able to establish one. My threshold tends to be diazepam equivalents of 80 to 100 milligrams per day within the first 12 to 24 hours. The key with regards to benzo resistance is just early recognition and involvement of critical care and HAU because you're gonna to need to give such high doses of sedative medications that's really not gonna be able to be safely managed within the emergency department or an inpatient setting. 
The other important thing is that more often than not, there's other factors that are contributing to this benzo-resistant withdrawal. So co-occurring substance withdrawal, in particular other sedatives like GHB or benzodiazepines, or acute medical illnesses. There's lots of medications that have been looked at. See what you're comfortable with, see what your HAU is comfortable with, your critical care is with, but initial kind of approach that could be helpful is just regular benzodiazepines. So last kind of topic oh, yeah, is looking at relapse got, prevention. We're running short on time. Any last uh, last minute pearls you might have for the, the, the audience? Or? Yeah. So I would just say for relapse prevention, medications are better than psychosocial. Um, the important thing in terms of looking at medications is that there's FDA for medications listed there. Uh, naltrexone is probably the safest from the ED. It's an opioid antagonist with a number needed to treat of nine. The main things to consider is that it's relatively contraindicated with hepatic dysfunction and make sure that patients are not on opioids because then you'll induce precipitate withdrawal if you start them on naltrexone. And that's it. And a good resource to look at is the UBCCSU guidelines. Awesome work. Thank you so much, Isabel. I think we got some time for a few questions here. The first one is, how do you ask the patient if they had a history of DTs? Is there a specific phrase or line you have to communicate this question? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. So generally I have two components. I ask about timeline. So with after two days of cessation of alcohol, um, and then essentially you want them to have experienced it in an inpatient setting. So were you confused, admitted while in hospital and required to stay in ICU? Because within an inpatient setting, that mortality rate is still 10 to 20% and outside it's over 50%. So if someone's really truly experienced DTs outside of a hospital setting, I really pause and think that there might be something else going on because of those factors. Okay. Thanks. One more question that's popular is Dr. Miles, is there a risk of adverse effects of starting gabapentin at 300 TID right off the bat? Would you slowly titrate it up or is that not a concern for alcohol withdrawal patients? The Again, that's why I kind of approach more the PRN um, management with gabapentin. Generally, essentially, you're giving somebody who has a GABA deficiency, GABA agonism. So you've got a little bit more of a buffer than someone, say, who has neuropathic pain where you're starting gabapentin for that. Generally, I say start with a 300 milligram tab, and then they can start maybe increasing up to three tabs in the fashion that I, I described to prescribe it keeping in mind to warn them that if they experience sedation to pull back. Thank you. And uh, maybe a, a quick one here. Can you have withdrawal seizures without other signs of withdrawal? If so, how common? And what's the typical timeline? Typical timeline for seizures is within 24 hours, most commonly within kind of six hours since their last consumption of alcohol. And that can just be even reduced alcohol. Generally, seizure without any alcohol withdrawal features is very rare. I mean, I hate to say never in medicine because we're always surprised, but it, that if there's no other features to suggest that GABA glutamate imbalance, you want to consider that there's something else happening. Could alcohol, mild alcohol withdrawal contributed to the seizure? Yes, but there's probably another primary diagnosis happening. Okay. Thank you very much, Isabel. It was a great talk. And again, for any questions that Isabel didn't have a chance to answer, we will have them available afterwards. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. So